Hello, welcome to the next episode of Discipleship Devotion and Discussion, Triple D. We're very excited to, to be with you today. Um, we are missing our pastor. Um, yes. He's at Synod this week, along with many other um, church leaders and denominational leaders. And so we're hoping they're having a wonderful time in Florida. Um, but we're doing our episode with just Ethan and I today. Yes, yes. So we do this from time to time. As uh, longtime viewers, if mm -hmm. we want to call you all that, uh, we'll be aware of. Every now and again, when Steve is not available, then we'll bring in Miss Laura to do a short discussion uh, with us on the show. Now, today, we're actually going to switch it up a little bit. So before, in just our topics, we've talked about book recommendations. We've talked about Christian literature, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked about family worship as well. That was one of our episodes. Uh, today, we're actually going to do a book review. So Laura and I usually enjoy reading with one another. Uh, reading out loud, this is something that we do in the evenings and would highly encourage anybody who's interested in that to look into it, uh, especially Christian literature uh, or non-Christian literature to an extent, too. Yeah. We're reading Lord of the Rings right now, uh, which was written, of course, by a, uh, a professing Christian. But um, anyway, that's another point. So today we're actually going to review a book. We're going to discuss a few things, look up some scripture points as well. This is a biblical counseling book, actually, that was given to me by my in-laws uh, when Laura and I were actually engaged. So this is Jay Adams, a well-known pastor and figure to many who's since gone to be with the Lord in the past year, actually. And this is his short little book, Christian Living in the Home. Christian Living in the Home, it was written in about 1972. Uh, it was written in the early 70s. So a little bit of outdatedness here and there, of course, you know, how the time keeps marching on. Uh, that's almost 50 years ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, hard to believe that that's 50 years ago, of course. Uh, but that is the case. And then, of course, Dr. Adams has since gone on to be with the Lord, but he's the father of the biblical counseling movement. Uh, this is a very short book. It's only about 120 pages or so. Very short, very easily accessible. He's very direct, and there's no theological ease in it, if you want to call it that, too. There's no academic ease. This isn't rigorous, scholastic theology that you would find in Francis Turretin or, or Herman Bavinck, either. Uh, but this is just short, practical wisdom. It's something that can easily be walked through. So, Laura, why don't you open us up with your, some of your discussions and thoughts on the book then? Yeah, one of the, the early um, things that he brings out that, that's very important um, is he talks about the, the primariness of marriage within the mm. family. And so you have so many times, and he dealt with this in many counseling situations, where the parents, after they have children, we're expecting our first baby, so this is something for us to take into consideration, their entire lives revolve around their children. And mom and dad end up focusing all of their, their interest and their time they spend together on their children rather than on their own relationship. And then when those children go to college, move out, they're living their own adult lives, the parents find that they don't really know each other or perhaps wouldn't call themselves in love with each other anymore. And mm -hmm. so he talks about the dangers of that in many families, and that's certainly something that every couple needs to be concerned about. Their primary focus should be on each other as husband and wives, and then the children should play a secondary role in that. And that's mm -hmm. better for the children and better for the parents because the parents are going to have a relationship that continues even whenever they're no longer focusing on taking care of children with most of their time. So that was a really important early note. Definitely. And how many marriages do we know that when the children grow up and move out, they end a divorce mm -hmm. or they end up having a lot of intense marital difficulties too? Uh, we see that in the church and outside of the church as well. Uh, there's a lot of issues that happen because the marriage is not based on love of one another, on the husband and the wife, and it's not based on Christ as its bedrock as well, and they're based upon the children. Uh, they're based upon ball games. They're based upon time spent with the children. The children have become little idols in their own right, and the husband and the wife simply fall through the cracks. They never spend any time with one another. So I'm going to go to one verse as well. I uh, wanted to begin this, of course, but we'll jump right into it now. This is the proof text. This is one of the largest texts in counseling that is always used. Uh, sometimes it's taken out of context, of course. It's an often misused verse. Uh, but this is often used in counseling situations 
in familial life, in understanding, and in sanctification as well. So it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, which reads, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who would not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Now, in the context, this is talking about idolatry. It's talking about meat that's been sacrificed in temples, uh, and Christians partaking of that. So the Church of Corinth just has all of these problems. But all of these temptations, number one, Christ always provides a way for escape. So in the home and in the home life, these temptations to idolize your children over your own marriage or uh, to over-discipline children, to sin. I mean, we're still sinners, of course. Uh, even though we're believers, we still have to deal with a lot of these temptations and issues. Christ always provides the way of escape, and the way of escape is found in his scriptures. And notice one other thing, that there is no temptation that is unique in the strictest sense of that word. And unique simply means one. That's the only kind of that. Christ is the unique, the only begotten Son of God. There's only one uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, but there is no temptation that is unique to you or to me or to you, Laura. There's no temptation that has not been seen. You know, Ecclesiastes also says there's nothing new under the sun. And that's very true and very pivotal in understanding not only Adams's book, but in understanding any counseling situation or when you're going through temptation and trial. Know that Christ is going to give the answer, the way of escape. He always provides that, uh, which is focused on him of course, and it's focused on his scripture, and then it is not unique to you. This temptation that is happening to you, there's somebody else who's gone through it, and you can access that in the scriptures or in the wisdom of the church as well. You can go to your elders, you can go to your pastor. Um, absolutely, so that is the most pivotal text that's central to this, mm -hmm. as understanding that all of these problems that are going to happen in your marriage, with your children, and in your family life, it's not unique to just you. Uh, you may think that from time to time, but it's not unique to just you. No temptation is unique to man. Uh, there, This has always been occurring ever since the fall uh, of Adam and Eve. So, Laura, why don't you talk about a few more things as well from yeah. your, your side of things? Yeah, so one of the chapters that's a little bit weaker, in my mm. opinion, is the chapter that's on singleness. And so, since the book is almost 50 years old at this point, and singleness is getting more and more prevalent in our Western culture. And we know many Christian friends of both of us that want to be married, but they're just not, and they're getting older. And, and there's a lot of specific temptations that they deal with. Dr. Adams, in his book, he tries to address that biblically, um, but it may not be in, in the most thorough mm. way possible because he doesn't make it clear that God does not promise marriage in Scripture. That's certainly something that we seek, and we seek to, to utilize our singleness. And, and he's maybe a little bit too brief on discussing those things. He's like, these are the things you should do to get ready for marriage and seek after it, and then uh, assumes that, that God's going to provide that. And we know sometimes that takes a long time, and sometimes that doesn't even happen uh, for Christians that wish to be married. Mm -hmm. And so that's... That is one of the weaker chapters. Um, it does have some so useful elements in it, but that is an important note um, that that a more thorough treatment of singleness would be would be helpful. Absolutely, you know, Adams is a. I mean, he's as you said, the book is fifty years old. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that a lot of work has been done on a theology of singleness as mm -hmm. well, and on understanding that. And we're not advocating something that's been advocated in such circles in the PCA or in the SBC as the revoice Christian, the celibate and same-sex attracted Christian, that's not what we're saying at all, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. If you experience that, know that it's a temptation and there is a way of escape. Uh, the way of escape is through Christ and through the Bible. Uh, but Adams could have used some more fleshing out of that, mm -hmm. though. And there's been a lot of work done in recent years on mm -hmm. that. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul was single. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a lot of benefits that single people have, mm -hmm. uh, and often they fall through the cracks in the church. Mm -hmm. uh, we often focus, and we, which we should, focus on the family mm -hmm. of the families in the church, the families that make up the church, mm -hmm. since the family is the bedrock basic of mm -hmm. society, the basic unit of society. Mm -hmm. But we also need to pay attention to our singles in church, mm -hmm. uh, make sure that they don't fall through the cracks. And that was mm -hmm. probably the weakest chapter that he mm -hmm. had in both of our opinions yeah. as well. 
So I'm going to speak briefly on probably one of my favorite chapters, mm -hmm. which was one of the most helpful since Laura is pregnant right now. We're expecting mm -hmm. our first child. Uh, the section on discipline, on discipline of children was very, very helpful. And this is one of those areas, especially that we get a little bit squeamish about in Western culture. Uh, Adams, Adams makes it very clear from the Proverbs as, and the rest of Scripture as well that we're not to spare the rod. Uh, so spanking children is that is what we're called to do. Uh, you are, that is a legitimate way of exercising discipline. Uh, the Bible says that we're supposed to do that. We're not to spare the rod. Uh, that's a little bit unsettling sometimes to modern Western ears, but nonetheless, it's still true. Now, that doesn't mean that you can become a tyrant. Now, he breaks that chapter into two sections. One, there's underdiscipline, which is basically coming from laziness. Uh, that's on us as fathers and as uh, men as well as the leaders of the household. We're called to exercise discipline. Uh, you're not called to just be lackadaisical, and Adams makes a big point of consistency. The consistency is key. If you say that something is going to merit a punishment, don't simply gloss over it and allow it to go unpunished. Otherwise, little Johnny's going to keep going back and back to it, and he's going to test those boundaries even more and more. And the other side of the coin, though, is over-discipline, which everyone knows those overbearing fathers who just seem like tyrants. So we were talking to some friends of ours not too, too long ago, actually, in a church who experienced such trials. Uh, and it's heartbreaking to see that happen. And that's the other side of the coin. Uh, notice that, too, when our Father disciplines us, our Heavenly Father, that is, in mm -hmm. Hebrews, uh, it says that He disciplines those whom He loves. He mm -hmm. chasteneth those whom He loves. Mm -hmm. And our Father always meets out enough discipline mm -hmm. that it makes us not want to do that again. Mm -hmm. But it's never overbearing. Mm -hmm. And he, we know that He's always there. He's our rock and our recourse. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, when my father disciplined me when I was a kid, uh, he was always ready to hug us afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura, you wanted to speak some to that yeah, as well. Yeah, one of the, the important notes, and my parents never practiced grounding for mm -hmm. us, that type of, of practice, but one of the important notes that I had never thought about before Dr. Adams brought it up was that whenever you have a long-term punishment for mm -hmm. a child and that relationship is broken then for, for weeks, so you ground a child for a week and you have to have a bad attitude and a grumpy face toward them for that whole mm -hmm. week because mm -hmm. that's part of their punishment. And he talks about how unhealthy that is because that's mm -hmm. not modeling Christian forgiveness and restoration. Mm -hmm. That's not how Christ treats us, how God our Father treats us because we repent and we're restored and we're forgiven. Mm -hmm. So those long-term punishments that are so different from, from a quick spanking and then restoration, there's, there's real consequences but they're not long-term, and forgiveness and restoration and the, the sweet relationship between the parent mm -hmm. and child is quickly restored. And I thought that was such an important note that many parents don't think about. It. And sometimes they can hold grudges against their children, and maybe it's not even supposed to be a punishment, but that's not the sort of thing that we want to foster. We want to foster restored relationships quickly so our children don't learn that keeping grudges is a good idea sin against us and truly hurt us throughout life. Mm, absolutely, and that's a model of how a Christian parent should act in mm -hmm. discipline as well, according to the Scriptures, too. So, Laura, let's switch to one area that we mm -hmm. thought was very helpful. We thought mm -hmm. that the, uh, I thought that the men chapter in there, the loving leadership, was very, very helpful. And, of course, there's a big proof text for this and mm -hmm. how marriage is like Christ in the church. Paul is talking about this in Ephesians chapter 5. So, mm -hmm. Laura, why don't you start reading that okay. text, too, with 22 through 24. Now, this is okay. pertaining to women. Mm -hmm. Uh, so talk about that a little bit yeah. and read the text. So it begins in verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And so Dr. Adams go goes through and is very talks about how repetitive these verses are. Like, there is no way that you can doubt that that submission mm -hmm. is required. And we know that part of the curse is that as women, we struggle with submission to our husbands. And that that's one of the challenges we deal with. The, the chapter has a lot of great wisdom and application of these verses, though I would say that his chapter, Word to the Wives, has a lot of, of cultural um, examples and contextualizations that maybe aren't quite as helpful now. Um, there's there's a lot of things that have changed, like the modern homeschooling movement had barely started at that point, and so many things that we think about, like the roles of women in the home, um, they, they have, they've taken on new focus now and, and new responsibilities. 
and he's really excited about bread baking in there. It was um, it was hilarious, yeah. actually. I mean, we were laughing for a good three minutes on that one, just yeah. like, what, what are you getting on about? So, man? so he has biblical uh, words to say, and he applies these verses, but you may have to make some contextualization changes and understand the, the time period it was coming from. There were very different um, things going on in society, but the biblical principles stay the same. Absolutely. The Lord's biblical principles do not change. Mm -hmm. Christ mm -hmm. is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the culture does change, mm -hmm. and some of our understandings of the culture change as mm -hmm. well. Uh, the scriptures always stay the same, and the biblical response mm -hmm. should stay the same too. But yes, some of the cultural stuff, though, it, it is uh, a little bit entertaining, though. Mm -hmm. So in that vein, too, wives are called to submit. Mm -hmm. uh, Adams is very clear, too, that the husband, and as we are, as I'm a husband, and if you're a husband watching this or a father, know that you've got your work cut out for you because wives are called to submit just as the church is called to submit to Christ. Now, the church strays a lot, and the Bible is clear that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It happened in the Old Testament. It's going to happen in the New. Laura, you got that really clear, too, when mm -hmm. you said that is not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. Now, the husband's job is impossible mm -hmm. because you're called to love as Christ loved his church. Now, Christ never sinned, nor was there any inkling of sin within him. Mm -hmm. He always loved perfectly. He's loved from eternity past, and he'll love to eternity future. Now, husbands, that's what you're called to model to your wives, too. It's an impossible task. Now, thankfully, we have a forgiving God for where we fail, and Christ has imputed his righteousness to us. So we're able to work and to do that which is pleasing to God. But it's an impossible task. But we can do something, at least. And we're called, to, here's our example, just as we're called to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, uh, through Christ, that is established because we are imputed His righteousness. Uh, but here's what the Scripture says what we're called to do. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her, so that He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the Word, that He might present to Himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. There's two great challenges right there. Men, you're to love your wives as Christ loved the church, and we know his love for us if we've been born again. Mm -hmm. That is an exceptionally high mm -hmm. calling. But women, of course, don't have nothing to do. Uh, they're not to just sit idly on the sidelines. They're called to submit just, mm -hmm. as, uh, just as the church submits to her Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so two very hard tasks. Mm -hmm. But husbands, this is up to you too. Uh, you're called to lead well. You're called to exemplify how Christ leads and loves his church. And with that, I'm going to turn to one more thing that I wanted to discuss as well. And as a, uh, as a seminary student and as one who works for the church and as one who is a ministerial student and is licensed by Presbytery as well, this book is very helpful for counseling situations, uh, not just from a minister to a layperson or to a new couple who's just establishing their home and trying to learn the ins and outs, or to new parents who are looking to learn how to correctly and biblically discipline their children, or a man and a wife in their relationship. Uh, but it's also helpful for older folks in the church, uh, for those who have been married for sometimes 50, 60, 70 years in some cases, to come alongside of younger men and women who are just getting married or just beginning to have children and say, here's an easy book to look at. It's only 120, 130 pages. And uh, you can point to specific chapters and say, this chapter is really, really helpful. Uh, we're called to be the body of Christ. We're called to love and help one another in the church. Uh, the older saints are called to come alongside the younger saints. First Timothy and Titus make that very, very clear. Uh, and it's charged to men and to women what they're supposed to do in the church. Uh, and you too, as an older saint, are called to do that. You're called to come alongside the youngers. 
uh, the younger people in the church. And this book is very, very helpful for not just younger saints, but it's also helpful for older saints to know how to continue to be sanctified in a very practical way. So I would encourage uh, all of our members at Living Hope, I would encourage others who watch this program, it's a very helpful book. It probably won't cost you more than $20 at the most from P&R, from Presbyterian and Reform Publishing, uh, but a very helpful book. A little outdated in some areas, perhaps. A few cultural idiosyncrasies here and there. Just little cultural anomalies, too. Things that are... Blue you know, you jeans. Can, yeah. Blue jeans and long hair. <laughs> uh, that's one of the comments if you read it. And you're going to laugh at a few of them, too. Adams <laughs> is very direct and very frank. Uh, he's got some great advice and some biblical wisdom in it, though. Uh, he was, was the father of the biblical counseling movement. Uh, and it shows in this little book. So, Laura, anything else that you wanted to add then? I think so. Why other don't than you? I would second the recommendation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, why don't you take us out then and I'll turn yes. uh, the channel then, so yes. to speak. Thank you. So, we are so glad that y'all could join us today. We hope that God is blessing your home and family. And we encourage you to, to seek out help in your church as you're struggling as a family and know that there are biblical answers to the, the sins and the problems that you deal with. And our church leaders would be happy to help with any challenges that, that you're dealing with here at LHP um, or with other needs in other churches. And we wish you a wonderful week and hope you will tune in to Triple D in the future. Thank you.